Good evening, everyone. A very warm welcome to you all to this opening event for the STEAM Art Collaboration Exhibition on behalf of Science Foundation Ireland. My name is Ruth Freeman and I'm the Director of Science for Society at the Foundation. For those meeting us for the first time, Science Foundation Ireland is the national funding agency for research in the areas of science, technology, engineering and maths, or STEM as it's often called. We invest public funding in research that makes a real difference to our society and our economy. In recent years, the A has been added into STEM to represent how the arts, the A in STEAM, and the sciences will always work together in tandem, both playing important roles in our lives. Of course, that separation of the A only happened in, in very recent times. Um, we all know the great Leonardo da Vinci, who never drew a line between the worlds of creative and artistic genius and that of mathematical engineering and scientific genius. In so many things that we do, the arts and sciences come beautifully together. You know, from the amazing, beautiful patterns that we see in nature, how they captivate our eyes, to the designs of the machines that we use every day. Our phones, our clothing, our buildings, our music, they all draw from the creative arts and from scientific innovation. An important part of our role at Science Foundation Ireland is to ensure we provide access and opportunity for everyone's voice to be heard and to help shape the research that serves our society. I think it's fair to say that throughout the last year, we understand better than ever before the importance of research and evidence and the part they play in informing our choices and decisions for our shared society. But I think so many of us also know how we have turned to nature and art to help us understand how we feel about existing through this pandemic. And sometimes we've needed to experience the, the rawness of nature and, and had art in our lives to lift our spirits. Research has always played a critical role in all of our lives from medicines and vaccines to understanding behavior, to informing us about critical issues like climate action, and of course, how we have managed through the last 15 months. Sometimes we welcome those results and outputs, but sometimes we're afraid of them. Sometimes we're hopeful of what they might signal for the future. But I think for us at Science Foundation Ireland, you know, we, we've been spending a lot of time considering whether, whether we all talk about this enough. It has such a big impact on all of us. I mean, we've been reflecting on the different way different technologies have, have had journeys in society. I mean, if you consider things like genetic modification to plants, you know, versus new digital technologies that arose on the internet, you know, one elicited a lot of fear and was stopped early in its tracks, while the other developed and integrated into every part of our lives before we ever really had a chance to think about it. Both technologies have potential to bring great benefit to society, but yet both can also bring great harm. And certainly I believe that if we had more opportunities for discussion about new technology and science, hopefully we can maximise the benefits of progress while minimising any potential negatives. And, and I think it also means that creative, innovative ideas that might actually improve or, you know, drive technology development can be identified, things that we're not even thinking about right now. Artistic works, whether they're visual, experiential, aural or performances, they capture a perspective. They start a conversation, inspire a process. They captivate us. They help people move from this world to another imagined place through the eye and the intellect of the artist. So many conversations flow from experiences when we engage with, with art. You know, how often have you passed a sculpture or walked out from a play or a film screening and spent the remainder of the evening where you either can't get it out of your own head and, and it sort of helps you to, it sparks new ideas or you're chatting to family and friends about your thoughts on that experience, even better if it's a shared experience that you can discuss. You know, for us as a scientific agency, you know, we understand that important conversations might not happen if people are just interacting directly with data or evidence coming from research. 
because in a way we have to think about the way people have different perspectives and we believe that celebrating and, and bringing together the worlds of art and science help bring all of those perspectives into the conversation and that's really important to get to the heart of the science too. Well, tonight we are meeting artists, scientists and engineers who work together to do just that, bring art and science together. They work together to create artworks that represent some of the most interesting and exciting science in our lives. So tonight and during this exhibition, we will explore the world of STEAM through these experience, through the experiences that we will hear more about shortly. From the invention of new technologies that help make our lives and communities better to the new discoveries that come from cutting edge science. These are best when people bring together different perspectives. Uh, that's how we're going to find solutions to the world's challenges. We firmly believe that working together helps us go beyond our own imaginations and create very exciting new possibilities. For this STEAM art collaboration, five incredible artists, Ling Heaney, Siobhan Doherty, Peter Nash, David Beatty and Ed Devan worked alongside researchers from five of the S5 research centres, the APC Microbiome Centre, the Connect Centre that looks at telecoms and networks of the future, the ICRAG Centre which looks at geosciences, the Lero Centre which looks at software and Future Neuro which looks at conditions of the brain. Over the last eight months they have worked as teams to create artworks inspired by a range of discoveries happening in the research centres. The public's engagement with these artworks, so your being here this evening, is as important as the creative process that brought these artworks to life. I know that everyone who's been involved in creating the exhibition here will be fascinated and so excited to hear the discussions that are sparked by this exhibition. In a moment, I'll finish up and I'll hand you over to my colleagues, Marina and Hannah, who will introduce you to the artworks and the collaborating teams. First, though, I just want to briefly tell you about something very exciting that will happen later this year. Uh, Minister Simon Harris and the government uh, will be asking everyone in Ireland to share their creative ideas for what the future in Ireland could look like. Maybe you have a problem you'd really like to see a solution for, or more importantly, maybe you have an idea about how a really thorny societal problem can be solved. I'm sure that many people from all walks of life, many of whom have never worked in research, probably have fascinating, fantastic, imaginative ideas that we haven't even thought of in the research world. We'll be announcing this national conversation very soon. There'll be lots of ways to participate, so we hope as many of you as possible do join in. In addition to what you'll see tonight, each of the teams have created a primary school activity for classrooms all over Ireland to experience these artworks. If you have young people or indeed teachers in your lives, tell them to check out primaryscience.ie for more information. You'll bear with me for just a few more seconds. I'd like to really thank the artists and the SFI Research Centre teams for their beautiful work. I mean, we, we are absolutely thrilled to be you know, part of this exhibition. It's really wonderful. And I would like to thank the amazing SFI team who worked on this, you know, from an inception all the way through to what we have this evening. Marina, Hannah, Connor, Michael, Margie, they've all worked so hard to bring this exhibition to you tonight and, and, and over the coming weeks. And finally, thank you for coming tonight. Um, I, I promise you we, we weren't hoping for the rain that much, but we're delighted you've all decided to, to come and hear the exhibition. I hope you thoroughly enjoy it. And maybe tonight this will kick off some conversations in your world about the topics that inspired these artworks. So finally, just can I say enjoy the show and I'm going to hand you over to my colleague Marina. Thank you. Thanks a million, Ruth. And it's great to see everyone here this evening. Thanks a million for joining the STEAM Art Collaboration. Um, my name is Marina. I'm one of the people on the team for the STEAM Art Collaboration with my colleagues, Hannah. And as mentioned before, Connor and Michael are behind the scenes tonight as well. Um, just to bring you on the journey of the STEAM Art Collaboration. This was something that was initiated back in August and September of 2020. We started with a seed idea of having some funding where we were looking at how do we engage people with science, but not in a traditional way. 
How do we give artists the same power as scientists in deciding what we do for the future? So this collaboration is very much a 50-50 collaboration. On the part of the artists, we've got the creative insight, the creative processes, also the knowledge and the skill to create things that are beyond our imaginations or beyond even realistic items. On the other side, we've got researchers who are engaged in cutting edge research, everything from right on the cusp of looking at brain disorders, looking at the gut and how that feeds our brain and how things work, looking at PCR testing, which is very relevant in today's world. And then we hop over to places like ICRAG and geosciences, where we're looking at everything from seabed mapping to sound and how that interacts with the environment around us. Then we're looking at the Connect Centre and our communications, which are so important. In all of these things, and Lira with software, we're looking at design. We look at design all of the time, but what we re rarely ask for is that professional input into what the output of that is. So to bring you on the, the journey, we started in September last year. The idea was initiated where we looked at bringing people together we looked at the idea of getting expressions of interest from researchers who might want to get involved in the creative side and tap into those processes. And likewise, from artists who are very well established and wanted to look at their contribution to the science world. We ended up with some fantastic collaborations. And the only way I can say this is this has blown our minds just as much as it should blow yours. Um, looking tonight, we've got a 3D exhibition space for you to explore. So that is a launching tonight and will be open for three months. We've got resources for primary schools, as we've mentioned previously, created by the 50-50 collaboration of artists and scientists in this case. They will be available for everyone to use. There will be a program coming with this exhibition that will allow you to self-guide around the 3D exhibition area as well. And just to draw your attention to a few small things, when you enter the exhibition, remember that this is not a real building. This is a, an imaginary space. Um, when we're looking at the pieces on the wall, we could play with scale um, and we could try out new things that may not have been possible. When we look at the videos that are created, we looked at how we could represent them in the exhibition space. And due to the quality and 360 degree of some of the videos displayed, we've decided tonight that you will see a little small play button in the corner of each piece. And when you click that button, an image will come up there is a hyperlink down on the right hand corner. So just to be aware of that, it doesn't go directly into the video. There's a hyperlink down in the right hand corner that you need to be aware of. I'm delighted to say to you that we have a fantastic group of skills in the room. It's great to see um, skills that I as a scientist could never even imagine. And I imagine the other way around, there's been learnings there too. So for now, I'm going to hand you over to my colleague, Hannah, who has played a huge role in these collaborations and getting these project teams together and just to start on what the journey on that side was. Thanks so much Marina. So as Marina mentioned and um, we put out a call for expressions of interest for this project and the results were overwhelmingly positive. We got so many people contacting us about this project to register their interest. We enlisted the help of SFI staff and a volunteer from the Irish Museum of Modern Art to shortlist the expressions of interest down, from, down to five research centres and 15 phenomenal artists. Following this, we organised a networking meeting between the researchers and the 15 shortlisted artists. And at this meeting, they got to hear from each other about their work and discuss the project as a whole. Following this meeting, the artists and the researchers met to discuss potential collaborations and work together on final proposals for SFI. And the final selection of five projects took place based on these proposals, again with the assistance of our volunteers from SFI and from IMA. The calibre of the submissions were outstanding and completely exceeded our expectations, and excitement about the project only grew from here. From this point, the artists and the researchers started their work together and they met with both, both with us and between themselves. And it was at this point that the strength of these types of collaborations really started to come into play. For example, um, we found out that Ling Heaney, the artist who was working with the ICRAG Centre for Applied Geosciences, Geosciences, had a huge interest in geology, along with her expertise in animation, which served to strengthen their collaboration from the beginning. And as another example, artist Siobhan Doherty found out early on that Cormac Gahan from APC Microbiome is a musician as well as a researcher, and Cormac's band Boa Morte provided music for the final work. 
The artists and the researchers are only a portion of the people involved in the project. The education and public engagement managers and the communications managers in the research centres had a huge role in this project too, keeping the projects going and assisting with the educational resources and the promotion of the project. This also wouldn't have been possible without the SFI staff who volunteered to help with the selection process. And we would like to thank Brian Hogan from Emma, who has assisted hugely with the selection process. Thanks also, as Marina mentioned earlier, to our SFI colleagues, Connor and Michael, who are here tonight making sure the webinar is running smoothly. Thanks also to Ruth for her lovely words at the start of the event and for her support of this project. Uh, thanks to our communications team and also to our own education and public engagement team. We'd like to give special thanks as well to Sarah Coyne, uh, who's an illustrator who illustrated our beautiful logo for the STEAM art collaboration, along with five stunning illustrations that you can see in our primary school resource. And also a huge thanks to Lisa and Michael, our Irish Sign Language interpreters for this evening. And finally, we, we would like to offer a huge thank you to the artists and the researchers. We can't understate the amount of time and work that went into this project by both by both of those groups. Their enthusiasm for and dedication to the project has been absolutely palpable from the beginning and they consistently went above and beyond from, for, for this project since day one. And all of this work has led to the five phenomenal artworks that we will be showing you this evening. So without further ado, we're going to bring you into our very first artwork, which is The Invisible Made Vi Visible by Siobhan Doherty, made in collaboration with APC Microbiome. This piece shows the parallels between PCR testing and lino printing, featuring music by Boa Morte. We'll start by showing you the video piece and then we'll show you the triptych lino print that Siobhan has produced. So we're going to start off now with the video. You may have heard of the PCR test for COVID-19. But what is PCR and how can it help us detect the tiny, almost invisible coronavirus that causes COVID-19. It is very difficult to see something that is small and present in tiny amounts. For instance, trying to see one jellyfish when we look at a huge ocean is not really possible. But we can see large numbers of jellyfish when they are all together. If we have many jellyfish as a group or bloom of jellyfish, we are much more likely to be able to see them. PCR, which stands for the polymerase chain reaction, is a way of making copies of something called DNA. DNA is something that's found at the center of all living cells. It works like a tiny computer code telling cells what to do. But it is present in very small amounts, too small for us to properly see. PCR is a clever way of copying one tiny piece of DNA until we can see it, like a bloom of jellyfish in the ocean. PCR makes copies of DNA in a very specific way building up lots and lots of replicas of the original DNA. So after we carry out PCR, we can now see this large amount of DNA using a special machine. The coronavirus that causes COVID-19 has something like DNA at its center, called RNA, and we can detect this using the PCR test too. This is the test that is used to tell when people have the virus in their nose or mouth. To do this, a nose swab is taken to a lab where the PCR test is carried out. We then add chemicals that are important for PCR to work. These include chemicals called primers that find only the coronavirus DNA, ignoring all the other DNA that is present, and an enzyme that copies the DNA. Everything is added to a machine called a thermocycler. You can guess by its name that a thermocycler heats and cools the mixture over and over again. The mixture must go through three temperature stages in each cycle. In the first stage of PCR, the two DNA strands are broken apart by heating to high, almost boiling temperatures of 95 degrees for one minute. 
In the second stage, the primers we added find only the coronavirus DNA and stick to it. The primers are very specific and will only find the coronavirus DNA. This is carried out at a temperature of about 50 degrees. In the last stage of PCR, a chemical called an enzyme copies the coronavirus DNA. It can only make a copy if the primer has stuck properly to the DNA. This means that only coronavirus DNA will be copied, so the test is excellent at finding the virus. This is carried out at a temperature of 72 degrees. The thermocycler then goes back to stage one and the process starts again. So initially, one copy becomes two copies. Then we repeat the cycles again to give four copies, and then eight copies, and then 16 copies, and so on. The number of copies of DNA grows as we repeat more PCR cycles. By repeating this series of events up to 40 times, we build up many millions of copies of the DNA. We have gone from a very tiny amount of DNA to millions of copies. We now have an amount of DNA that we can see, similar to being able to see large amounts of jellyfish in the ocean. That was absolutely beautiful. So that was APC working with Siobhan Doherty and incredible lino print um, imagery created there to replicate PCR. Next up, we have Future Neuro who collaborated with David Beatty. David Beatty was an absolute champion on this project, leading everything from looking at hyperconnectivity in the brain, bringing that into an installation piece, looking at mixed media and how that interconnects with nature. Then he also looked at Interferometer, the second piece that you'll see in the exhibition today, which explores neural networks and looks at na natural creations and how they work. So to present to you today, this first piece is called Shifting Patterns of Light. The second piece that you'll see today is called Interferometer, which is an image. So first off, we're going to show you the piece as a whole. Take time to absorb and take it in. There is an inset video in this image as well, which we'll zoom into. So please keep your eyes open um, for that transition and we'll show you the image as well.
Piperkin activity is a state of unified communications in, in which the traffic handling capacity and bandwidth of a network always exceed the demand. The number of communications pathways and nodes is much greater than the number of subscribers. All devices that could conceivably benefit from being connected to a network are in fact connected. In the ultimate hyperconnected infrastructure, electronic and computer devices of all kinds can communicate among each other to whatever extent each individual user desires. That was absolutely phenomenal. And um, for our next artwork, we'll be showing Machines Eye View, which is a photography series by Peter Nash, made in collaboration with researchers at Lero, the SFI Research Center for Software. This is a series that brings us into an immersive world where we'll follow the journey of a self-driving car. So that was a piece by Peter Nash working with Lero, um, looking at AI and machine learning in cars. It brings up ethical questions as well, so we invite you to explore that more. Um, up next, we have Kagla, a 3D VR 360 animation. It's a film created by Ling Heaney with the ICRAG Center, Research Center for Applied Geosciences. It explores the marine environment in a very fantastical and magical way and mixes realism and surrealism with realistic depictions of seabed mapping. This is something we want you to sit back and enjoy. And for this, we're going to invite Ling to look and bring us through the sea and the creatures that we may meet on her underwater journey in Kabla.
That was absolutely wonderful. Some beautiful, very dreamlike imagery there. Um, so for our final artwork, um, we're delighted to present Rotation Relay, which is a kinetic sculpture by artist Ed Devan. This piece was made in collaboration with researchers from Connect, the SFI Research Centre for Future Networks and Communications. This piece interprets key concepts in quantum mechanics, such as superposition and quantum entanglement through its use of movement and light. We'll be showing a video of the sculpture first, but just to let you know, this video contains flashing imagery. So if you have photosensitive epilepsy, you may need to look away from your screen. Following the video, we'll be sharing imagery of this piece, so I'll let you know when the video is finished and when we're sharing this. So without further ado, we're going to go into the video of rota Rotation Relay. So if you had to look away from your screen there, um, it's okay to look back at the screen again. We're just going to share some imagery of the piece. Hey everyone, you're very, very welcome back. So we're going to kick off our series of in-conversation pieces now for this evening. So to start off, I would like to welcome botanical artist Siobhan Doherty. You may know her work from the All Ireland Pollinator Plan and researcher Dr. Cormac Gahan from APC Microbiome in Cork. You are all very welcome tonight and your work over the last six months has been nothing short of phenomenal. So to start off this evening, um, I'd just like to kind of point out that it was really clear from the beginning that this project team were really excited to hit the ground running. And from this sprung a bounty of imagination, possibilities and ideas as to how to portray the very difficult process of polymerase chain reaction testing or PCR testing as we know it, in an inventive and ingenious way. Siobhan, can you explain to us how you decided on using the very traditional method of lino printing to portray a really modern process and how this idea came about? Well, my initial, when, when you sent us the brief in the beginning about the research centers, the thing that caught my eye was the COVID testing because a lot of my artwork is based on nature. So I, my immediate thought was something, the work inspired by Ernest Haeckel, where he did all these beautiful, I, I was thinking of viruses and you know shapes and nature. And by chance, I have a brother who's a geneticist and I rang him before the meeting and I have to give him credit because I said, if you were translating PCR testing into art, what would you do? And he went, it's lino printing because you're taking something and you're replicating it. So um, then, so yes, I, I give my brother the credit for that, for that, um, for that idea. 
And then from then I was talking to Cormac and Cormac was explaining that he's a musician and his initial idea was of cycles and tying it in with music. But I, I like the idea of liner printing because it's something that children and learners can actually relate to. And I knew it was going out to school and I thought that they would be doing printing and replicating. So it actually works. So the concept then was just to align my artwork with the story that Cormac would tell. And he willingly agreed, thank God. <laughs> And it is, it is such a, 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 um, a really striking parallel when you watch the video and you can hear Cormac explaining about PCR. It is really amazing the parallels between, between the two methods. So uh, Cormac, I might come to you next. Um, so the name The Invisible Made Visible very much describes the work of not only APC as a whole, but specifically the use of PCR to amplify small invisible segments of DNA, or in, in the case of COVID-19, RNA. Would you mind explaining the science behind PCR testing and what it can be used for and your current research in this area? Sure, yeah, uh, thanks very much. Um, well, of course, yeah, you're right. Um, uh, the invisible made visible could be used to describe any type of microbiology. And we do microbiology in the APC Microbiome Center here in Cork. And we're interested in bacteria in the gut that influence our health and, and um, prevent disease and influence digestion, digestive health. Um, so we really need these type of methods that will allow us to identify things that are very small. <laughs> and so that's why uh, we use PCR quite a bit. And so PCR is, uh, it's a molecular method that allows us to identify pieces of DNA in a sample and to amplify those pieces of DNA by copying them um, from a, a level that's very small, because they're present in very small amounts, uh, to very large uh, copies. Uh, and that's what this uh, cycle of events does uh, that's described in the video. And so um, because it's very specific for a specific um, piece of DNA, we can design the PCR to detect viral DNA of, of a virus, but they're in very small amounts. Um, so the specificity of DNA is, is paramount, uh, of, of PCR is paramount in identifying that piece of, uh, of, of, of DNA or identifying the virus in the sample. So it's um, a very clever technique that allows us to specifically identify um, a piece of DNA in a sample by, by copying it, which is what um, is described in, in Chavon's artwork. Um, so it's used in diagnostics, it's used in forensics, it's, it's, we use it every day in our lab and um, used widely throughout the APC and, and all, all molecular biology labs. And of course, it has gained prominence um, through the COVID test, which is where we can design primers for the COVID, uh, the coronavirus uh, itself. So uh, I think that shows the diagnostic use of, of, of PCR. In my own research, I'm interested in how bacteria in the gut uh, prevent infectious disease. Uh, and we are working in the APC on coronavirus uh, in particular. Uh, and we have, um, as well as that, uh, Paul Cotter, Professor Paul Cotter in APC um, is running a large sequencing project looking at the different uh, types of the coronavirus um, and the new variants you know, across Ireland. So, um, so I hope that answers your question. It was a long question, so I'm trying <laughs> to answer the different bits. But no, uh, uh, ho hopefully it's explained by the, by the video, um, the, with, with, along with Siobhan's uh, fantastic art, artwork. It is. It's explained wonderfully. I was wondering if actually if, uh, if both of you could explain to us how the, I suppose, how the analogy of using a bloom of jellyfish versus trying to find one jellyfish in the ocean <laughs> came about, because it's such a wonderful idea. I'd love to hear a bit more about kind of your discussions around that and how that came about. Well, uh, I wanted to do something. One of the things I did want to do is if we were going to explain how the PCR test works, um, there's so much anxiety and worry and confusion and misunderstanding with the PCR testing. And one of the things I wanted to do was reassure people. And I also, from my part as well, I, I wanted to avoid the whole viruses and syringes. It, we just, we've done all that. We're fed, fed up with it. So again, I went back to my original inspiration, which was um, Ernest Haeckel and his Art Forms and Natures. And he used to, he did these beautiful, beautiful illustrations of jellyfish and um, other organisms that he found and it was the jellyfish that really struck me because I felt that they looked a little bit like a coronavirus with um with the DNA or the RNA if you looked at the compass jellyfish from the top 
And then the whole idea of RNA and DNA being extracted, that reminded me of the tentacles coming out from the, from the jellyfish. And then Cormac was explaining to me how it worked, you know, and there was a lot of, you know, things coming together and tangling and entwining together and then coming apart. And so basically we, this is how it developed. And then Cormac was the one who actually came up with the idea of the bloom of jellyfish, you know, in the sea that if you looked at a big ocean, I mean, it was a, it was a collab, very much a collaborative process, you know, um, and I'm, I'm very lucky that I was working with Cormac because he came up with this really, really nice narrative as well, um, which explains it. And then he just sent me the music and, he, and he's a brilliant musician as well. So I had the music and I had the narrative and it was just a matter of, I filmed everything that I did and he would say, you know, what about doing, you know, a line of print of this, of the swab or what about doing a line of print of the cell? <laughs> And um, so then I just had to align what I was doing with Cormac's story to tell the story of how PCR testing actually, the process actually works. That's amazing. Thank you so much, Siobhan. Actually, you mentioned the music there. Um, that's actually what I really wanted to ask you about that. So we, we had two art forums kind of accidentally or unexpectedly collaborating in this project. So for everyone, everyone in the room, I would love to hear the story behind the addition of music by Cormac's band Boa Morte to the final artworks. So when did you kind of find out that Cormac was a musician and when did the process of um, including Boa Morte in the artwork start? You had, okay, and for me, oh well, I knew, but their initial one had actually like the initial brief that Cormac had his idea was to make PC align PCR to music. So as soon as I heard that, I went, Cormac, <laughs> what about giving me some of your music? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, no, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, the idea of repetition and amplification is, is, is paramount in, in music, and composers like Philip Glass and so on use repetition a lot in their music. So um, so that was my initial concept was that, you know, you've got um, copying of different cycles of music could, could represent PCR, but I think line of printing works better because it's something that people can do and making prints is something that everybody can do. Um, so, um, well, I've been playing music with these uh, friends of mine in, in Boa Morte for about 20 years and we've been, we've put out a number of albums and a lot of what we, um, a lot of the music that we do is actually based on the sea and ambient, some ambient pieces that are based on, on I suppose, inspired by the sea and so on. <laughs> and so there were, I think it fits very well with, with what uh, Siobhan came up with in, the art, in terms of the artwork. So I was glad that it, 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 it fits so well. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. You know, it's very interesting because I remember you saying very early on that music is a very good, another good analogy for PCR testing as well. So it's lovely that uh, your music ended up being included in the in the final in the final piece. Uh, that's absolutely wonderful. Um, so I suppose one uh, last question I just would really like to know because it was so clear from the beginning of this project that your team really clicked from day one and that you really really enjoyed working together on this project. So I was wondering from both of you, um, what would you say are the benefits to researchers? And artists collaborating in this way. Well, uh, I mean, you go first. Well, I, well, I go first. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it's it, uh, as a scientist, it, it really forces you to think about the science in a slightly different way, in terms of how you would communicate this, the science in in a in a way that maybe you haven't thought about before. Um, and this is a really good thing to do. And uh, from from the point of view of the public and the public's perception of science and the arts. I think it's important to sort of blur those lines between uh, the arts and, and science, because I think people think of science as very logical and critical, uh, and the way that scientists think is, is very logical and critical, but actually there's a lot of creative thought that goes into science. Putting ideas together is a creative process. And so I think it's important to, to let people know that, that, um, that science isn't all about just being logical and, and critical that there is a creative process that goes into science and that students, students who want to become scientists and who can't decide between arts and science, you know, you can mix the two. <laughs> uh, so I think that's an important message to send out that there's a lot of um, creativity in science. Yeah, and um, that's from, my, from my part, I was just, I have always considered art as a language as opposed to um, something, it's a visual language. It's something that we, we respond to and I've learned from my own work as well that people are, they love the artwork, but they are very interested in the creative process. 
and from the very beginning we were talking about you know art or the the process of PCR and I was saying that's like the process of of art so um and I just wanted the art to be the language explaining the scientific process in a, in a different way so um and it was brilliant I learned so much on this project loads um, and I really enjoyed it that's amazing. I love that um, idea of art as a language. Uh, that's uh, that's obviously fantastic. And it's a very good point, Cormac, as well, that, you know, um, there is a lot of creative thinking in science. And uh, as well, there is um, a certain amount of science and art as well. You're not necessarily just one or the other. And if you can't decide which to do, you can incorporate elements of both in your career. That's absolutely lovely. Um, I think we're about out of time just for this for our, this q a session we might have to move on to our next one now so i just like to say a huge thank you to cormac and siobhan you've been amazing to work with over the last few months and your piece is absolutely beautiful so thank you both so much uh, this has been a wonderful conversation as well it's been so great to get your thoughts thank you thank you thanks thank you so much Perfect. So I might ask Marina to, to come back on screen now as well, just to introduce our next Q&A session. Thanks, Marina. <laughs> um, that was a great conversation, Hannah. And again, absolutely beautiful piece. So do check it out in the exhibition. Um, a marriage made in heaven with those uh, the musician side and the um, line of printing as well. So they come together really beautifully in the video um, and as you will have seen at the opening. The next that I'm looking at today is Future Neuro. Um, SFI Centre for Rare and and um, Rare and Chronic uh, Brain um, Research, and looking at that with David Beatty. Um, so David Beatty is an artist living and working in Dublin. Um, he's currently in Temple Bar Gallery and Studios and has exhibited um, solo exhibitions, but also has been in a number of collective exhibitions, not just in Ireland but across the world. Um, I've also joined by Christina Reich and Katie Benson from Future Neuro who are both looking into the areas of epilepsy and rare neurological disorders. Um, so lots of great research in this one. Um, this was an absolutely beautiful collaboration where we had our kind of, I guess, a joint thinking in terms of connectivity and, um, and connectivity in the brain. So looking at that and exploring that just a little bit more. So David, I'm gonna come over to you first. We were delighted to see you collaborate with Feature Neuro on this one. Um, we're looking at shifting patterns of light, which is the final name of the piece, and another section called interferometer, which was the one where we looked at the, the trees and the roots, if you remember from the beginning. Um, so just to come into this, um, you looked at neurology, um, you looked at neural connections in particular. So in your own words, can you describe to us what we're seeing um, in, your, in your work, shifting patterns of light? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Marina. Um, yeah, the work, uh, I think from the initial conversations with the research centre, so Susan, Katie and Christina, um, there was just so much to take in, really. And I think that probably applies to all the artists who were involved, but um, it's hard to know where to start. But I was really intrigued by um, the role of electricity in the brain and, and how that is used, really, as a way of processing information and connecting things uh, within the brain. So... I focused on that um, as a way of thinking about hyper or hyper connectivity in the brain. So how um, maybe signals can get sort of confused or sort of mismatched by sort of overstimulation. So uh, I was drawing parallels between um, neural activity and computing. So, and in many ways, there's lots of common language used uh, such as like in the computer world, there's deep neural networks, which is, um, and, and hyperconnectivity is, is also used quite a bit. So I was trying to sort of bring all of those in, uh, in a way that could be sort of visually represented, I suppose. Um, and normally my practice is a sculptural practice. So I do use a lot of objects and uh, three-dimensional sort of everyday things. Um, so to do that, uh, you can probably see from the images today that, um, I use quite a large TV, so a flat screen TV, so it's a 55 inch TV, just to give you a sense of scale. Um, and it's a broken TV, so I mean a lot of the conversations, particularly around epilepsy, but just other sort of um, maybe malfunctions or weight, sort of disruptions within the brain, uh, I was just trying to maybe think about that as a way of um, 
like the light and light, the use of light in their research and their in the lab was really prominent. So I was sort of focused on that really. And I suppose with the TV, the process of projecting LEDs in a TV and the disruption in that, the sort of broken screen and how it distorts the image was maybe a starting point for me. Um, so I started with that and then I overlaid that with another video piece or there's another smaller screen. Um, and that was a way of maybe thinking about this in a virtual exhibition as a way of, uh, somebody who has a sculptural practice as a way of thinking about it, how it might be experienced through a screen. So to try and work with both images and sort of distorted images to try and find a solution there. So yeah. Absolutely. Thanks, Millian. Yeah, there is a lot with this piece and there's a lot to take in when you're looking at it as well. We talk about um, neural networks and connectivity and electricity. And I know you also made a link there with bioluminescence. Um, so can you explain that just a small bit more and where you saw that link or how you visualized it? Sure. Um, I think it was some of the earlier conversations, uh, bioluminescence was given as an example of of how, uh, how it's used in their research um, and imaging of the brain and how uh, it's used to sort of light up so that the bioluminescence lights up parts of the brains when it's active. Um, and I was really intrigued by the functionality of that, but also just the visual of it. So there's some striking images, the research images that I was shown um, of your brains are firing at different points. So it just visually, it reminded me of bioluminescence and marine life. Um, and there's lots of types of marine life that use it. Uh, sort of angler fish is sort of one of the more prominent ones, but there's lots of squid and jellyfish that use it as well. So um, within the video, you can probably make out somewhere in the middle is sort of flashing blue lights. And it's a type of squid in Japan that when they're beached, they sort of rub off each other and they, they sort of fire off each other. So there's all these, I find it sort of interesting to think about that in a network sort of way as well, that um, these sort of natural networks within a sort of natural world uh, as, a, as a way of sort of connecting one thing to another. So, yeah. Absolutely. Um, it really came across that those connections actually flowed throughout the artwork. So we might come back to interferometer in a little bit as well. Um, so that's a really nice link in. You're talking about firing and electrical activity. So let's segue off into the brain and the research end of things. So speaking of kind of the visual process, we look at our brain and it's a really complex organ. We actually don't even understand most of what's happening in our brain. So when we look at the patterns that we're talking about with electrical activity, can we look at that from the research side? I might go over to you first there, Christina, because we know that some of your research is actually used in the final artwork. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, it, it's been such a, such a, um, a great opportunity to work with, with David and we had such a great brainstorm. So the brain is, uh, I would say, I, 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 I relate it as a very complex and the most complex and fastest computer in the world. So if, if we think in, in that way. And um, so our neurons are firing all the time and that's the, the neurons usually are the stars of the brain and are the, the first things that come up to our mind. But they are firing also like in a, in a physiological way. So all this light uh, is, is, is happening, it's been all the electricity has been creating all the, created all the time in the brain. So much electricity that could light, light up a bulb. And, and this is a, is, is a great analogy to, to understand uh, what is actually going on in the brain. So um, uh, that, that would be most of, um, of, 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 of the, the functioning uh, that we have. So of course, we really have a lot to understand about the brain. We, we know a lot, but we still, uh, we still have a long, way, a long way to go. And that's basically what we've been focusing in Future Neuro, to look uh, in, in a different aspects, not only in the normal brain, how it functions, but also what goes different. And uh, I think like David was extremely brilliant uh, representing it in, in his artwork. Yeah, it was absolutely fantastic. And I think that collaboration really worked extremely well. So Katie, just to come over to you as well, um, how did you find kind of the, I guess, moving into the world of art using um, your own brain to, to look at how you can display kind of research and how that communication works well? 
Yeah, I mean, it was a wonderful experience working with David and it was it was really enlightening, I think, for all of us to kind of see our work in a really new way and a different way. Um, I think, you know, as Christina was saying, our, our research in, in the research centre is so wide and varied and it, it was very apt, actually, that the theme of connectivity kind of came up um, because all of our work is connected um, around the, these kind of these neurons and how they send messages around the body. So I found a really, actually, it was a really, really fun, fascinating way to kind of see how everything ties together, much like all of the research uh, ties together. It was really, really fascinating. Loved it. Brilliant to hear. Um, so what we might do is I have a, an image over here of um, David's work, which is interferometer. Um, and just to bring you into, I guess, looking at those connections, the neural connections, and then seeing those patterns kind of replicate in nature. I know in my head, I think of mushrooms uh, under the under the ground coming up through the forest. Um, but David, I might um, hand this one over to you and just share your image here. If you want to show us um, what we should be looking out for in, in the artwork that's in front of us today. Sure. So this is the interferometer piece. Yeah, so I suppose, um, as part of the entire project, there's the sculptural element, which is this, the video screen or the TV screen with the extra video on top of it. Um, but there, there's also multiple parts. So this is another element, the photographic image, and it's probably about A3 in size, so not that big. But um, And then there was also some activities and sort of engagements with, for primary audience, uh, primary learners. So um, I've, I, I, as a way of sort of thinking about it, as a project, I, I wanted to think about it as a whole, really. And this image was a way of maybe um, sort of thinking about how to represent natural networks. So the root systems of a tree and the branches of a tree became a sort of very obvious way of doing that. But again, in the way that I was trying to think about the broken screen or ways of interrupting um, an image or interrupting the sort of linear sort of process of an image, uh, I used, I took a number of images of one tree. So you can probably tell from this, it's two images that are um, almost stuck together. So um, so one of them is a color image and one was a black and white, but it was taken in the winter. It's a fallen tree that was knocked down in the wind. So it has a combination of roots and branches um, together. So it's sort of hard to figure out what's the roots and what's the branches. And it also has a sort of slight dusting of snow on it. So it sort of, it almost automatically makes it a monochrome sort of image with the, even though one's black and white and one's color. So it has a, a sort of play, visual play on, on the color and a visual play on the, the composition really. Um, and an interferometer, it's called an interferometer, which um, some of you probably know that, you know, it's, it's a scientific instrument that's used to sort of measure disturbances or waves in sound and light um, most recently sort of famously used for uh, detecting dark matter so this sort of way of dividing the image or dividing light uh, or, or, or an image as we read it uh, was a sort of way of sort of thinking about that um, so yeah. Brilliant um, yeah just to draw attention to that piece I think it's really nice to get the kind of context behind it when you walk into the exhibition space as well so Kind of on a whole, I guess, um, Christina and Katie, you're doing a lot of work into, I guess, the future of, of where research is going with the brain as well. What can we expect to see in the future of, um, of where we're looking in, in terms of brain research? I'll let you go first, Christina. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think like we, we have we have lots of lots to expect. I think like we are we're making a huge progress. As I mentioned, we still have loads to discover. We still we have loads to understand. Uh, what another point that I would like to bring from David's work is that usually we focus on neurons, and uh, I think he beautifully has shown different uh, processes that are happening in the brain in different lights from different patterns. And uh, there comes other cell types that we are investigating as well, and to finding actual the, the, their actual role and uh, their 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 actual function. For instance, in my research, my own research on epilepsy. So uh, I I really found that extremely interesting. 
I would say uh, working therapeutics, uh, I would say we, we are ha having a hard work combining all the areas. And I think this is one of the beauties of, of Future Neuro that we can have the clinical side and scientists working in completely different areas. For instance, like Katie's work is absolutely different from mine and uh, that I work in, in therapeutic side. And uh, so uh, it, it's, it's really um, interesting to have all this combination and um, we we'll really hope that we can um, find solutions as regards diagnosis and therapeutics for, for the, brains, the brain diseases. So hopefully we, mm. we, we get more progress in, in the coming years. That's great to hear. And um, this collaboration has resulted in just a phenomenal amount of work overall. I know we see the artworks on the wall within the exhibition, but not only that, there is a whole host of primary resources there's a web interface created by David, which is there to explore. And it really opens up this idea of why are we not doing this kind of work already? Why are people not coming together and, and creating these amazing things um, in terms of, terms of that kind of STEAM um, aspect of things? So to come to everyone, is there anything that you think um, in terms of artists and scientists collaborating that can be learned that maybe we're not looking at already? So I might jump to Katie first on that one. Um. I think I think there's real value. I think when when we work as scientists, we we're very specialized in what we do. We look at a very very narrow um, view of of kind of the work that we're focused on, and I think experiences like this help us to to do what's really important, and that's to take a step back and see our work in a, a broader picture, and it helps us not only to understand our own work and put it in the context of what else is going on around around us, but it helps us to give us ideas of, of new people we can work with and, and new areas that our research can go in. So, I mean, it goes beyond just, you know, the, the, these fabulous resources and it, it, it's really valuable, I think, for the research itself as well. Yeah, that's a great answer. Thanks, Katie. I might jump over to you then, David. Um, yeah, well, I think in simplistic terms, like, often scientists are looking for answers and maybe artists are maybe asking questions and I think the process of working together actually reveals a lot of commonality and sort of methodologies of like how we work it's like the lab is often quite like a studio so you know it's there's a lot of common sort of practices there and I think the more you work with each other uh, it sort of reveals that there are lots of sort of interesting ways of working together and lots that can be produced and come out of it for that uh, are benefits both parties um so yeah i think uh yeah long may continue yeah absolutely i think this is the start of some great things and i i can't wait to see the responses of students to the resources that you've managed to create together because there is such a wealth of information in there so just to um, introduce Kira as well. So Kira is also on your team in Future Neuro, um, working in the public engagement side of things. Um, and Kira was also involved in this collaboration. And again, we'll be looking at kind of the future of this, where it can go with resources and stuff, but also with the exhibition itself being open for three months. There's loads to play with there and what you can do with that. So Kira, to come over to you on the public engagement side of things, where do you think projects like this can lead us? Hello everyone, thanks Marina. Um, I just had to jump in purely on from the perspective of that the collaboration between art and science. Um, one thing I will say is it takes the, the fear away. I think people are quite scared of science ever so slightly, um, whether it be from an experience we've had at school or whether it be, you know, memory or whatever the case may be. And just from a personal point of view, which I know that we said many times in our brainstorming experiences, it's so lovely to see uh, bright ideas, the engagement from the public when it comes to ourselves, maybe thinking about David's wonderful work and the engagement and the, the appetite is there. And I think that's what's really important not to forget that you know, we all do our individual roles and think that, you know, I'm doing my job and that's enough, but actually the appetite for the combination is there. And I think and hope that this is just the beginning of a wonderful collaboration and to continue it and continue that road of creativity as well. 
Oh, I just love your energy, Kira. I can feel it coming through the screen. That's fantastic. I think there's no better note or nothing more that I could say that can recap that so beautifully. So on that, thanks a million to David Beauty. Thanks a million to the Future Neuro team. You have been fantastic. And I can only imagine that there's more to come following this, judging by your words, Kira. So we really look forward to that. Um, and again, check out David's work and the resources if you're in, in the teaching side of things as well. So on that, um, we're going to say goodbye from this panel. Um, so it was great to have you and thank you for participating in the project. And I'm going to hand back over to my colleague Hannah now to go into our next in conversation. Thank you. Thanks so much, Marina. Um, so for our third in conversation session this evening, we'll be chatting to the team behind the project Machines Eye View, which brought us along the journey of a self-driving car. So I'd like to welcome the artist Peter Nash, uh, whose recent exhibitions include The Future Is Not Necessarily Set in Stone in Studio 12 Blackwater Artist Group in Cork, and I Remember Nothing, I Remember This in Garter Lane Art Centre in Waterford. I'd also like to welcome Dr. Martin Mullins from Lero, the Science Foundation Ireland Research Centre for Software. So Martin, I might start with you for this panel. Um, so artificial intelligence is already very ingrained in our day-to-day -day use of technology from the spam filter on our emails to recommendations for what film we should watch next on Netflix. And I've heard you mention previously that as cars move towards greater automation and move towards being self-driving, that the car will have to make certain ethical decisions independent of the driver. Now your research group has employed philosophers to work on the applied ethics of this technology. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the ethical considerations that Peter has interpreted so wonderfully in the, machine, in the Machine's Eye View project. Yeah, uh, Hannah, hi, uh, nice to be here. So yeah, it's great to work with Peter, really fantastic experience, so thanks Peter. Um, uh, so what we see in Peter's art is we see uh, a vehicle programmed to navigate the world, it's programmed to have an ethic of responsibility, which is interesting in itself. Uh, we see the vehicle uh, using the data set that Peter, Peter uh, uh, posited, taking, uh, uh, taking care of vulnerable people, uh, adopting a precautionary approach. Um, if we zoom out for a second, for the last 400 years or so, probably since Kant, human beings have been this, this kind of the center of the moral universe. Only humans had this kind of power to make moral decisions. So it's going to be interesting over the next decade or two that we're going to see a migration of ethical decisions away from people towards machines and in particular towards automated vehicles and i think that's that's what peter captured really well in, in his in his in his artwork i think it's really fantastic so coding i, I think in, from the Lero perspective, coding is going to become a philosophical as well as a technical challenge, and, and that and that and, it, and it's going to be an interdisciplinary space in the future. So we're going to have coders and philosophers, philosophers working together in challenges uh, uh, like the automated vehicle challenge. Yeah, it's really interesting, Martin. I've heard it described before as um, a human being in an unexpected um, encounter in a car makes a, rea a reacts, but a self-driving car will make a decision that has been pre-programmed there. So the kind of, I suppose, that's really interesting that you'll say the philosophers will be involved in the coding of these cars to make sure that um, everything's ethical. There's a huge amount there. Um, so Peter, um, we can clearly see that there was a huge amount for you to be inspired by throughout this project from the research of Lero, from the actual working of the autonomous vehicles to how the self-driving car sees the world around it and maps its environment. And also then, as Martin was just speaking about, the ethics behind how the cars are programmed. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your creative process behind this project and how you incorporated these elements into the work that we saw this evening. Yeah, uh, hello Hannah, hey, Martin. it's good to be here, thanks everyone. Um, there was a lot to take in from the very beginning really, uh, even just from initially chatting to Martin and Claire there as well at Lero, there was so many elements like all this, these things about morality and they like Martin's talking about philosophy and <clears throat> these are complex things to try and get into you know what was a discovery science you know for primary it aimed at primary learners it's quite a lot to get into that so i kind of initially
they had this idea that I would like to make this, some kind of like sculpture or something with a self-driving car driving around. And then we spoke about that and actually Claire and Martin put me onto this, told me about this experiment called Ducky Town. And I looked at that and I looked at a few different kind of experiments and they all had this very, I don't know, kind of like scientific aesthetic, if that makes sense. Like they were all kind of, they weren't especially engaging, I suppose, was because they were to do a certain thing. So anyway, we kind of, yeah, so I had this idea really that I wanted to make this thing just immersive and engaging. And then it made sense to use this aesthetic of like kind of stop motion animation and 3D sets and model making and like storybook kind of imagery because it was a language that was understandable to our target audience. So the idea was to just sort of bring everything into that. And so I incorporated elements of making and those drawing as well. Like we spoke at the beginning of the project, mapping it became apparent was like really important, especially in terms of self-driving cars and the way artificial intelligence is going and with computers, like if you think about how often we use something like Google Maps, for example, like all the time. And so to try and get children or primary learners just to engage with the notion of mapping and placing themselves in an environment like that became very important and so i really wanted to get that into the final work so yeah this, this could be quite a long answer now i've just realized i've <laughs> kind of got a long way to go still but so yeah there was a lot and then yeah so that was kind of where we started from. And then just a lot of different conversations about the way about trying to get all this stuff in. And then eventually it came, I just had to start making it and let it really develop from there. So once I started making, then we kind of just saw, just let it lead somewhere then. And I think you absolutely have achieved um, showing all of these um, really quite complex kind of ethical decisions in, in throughout your immersive world. It's really, and to, to do this all in um, um, a way that's, um, as you said yourself, is kind of appropriate for primary school learners is a huge, huge achievement. So also, I'd just like to introduce, we have uh, Claire here from Lero as well, who's the Education and Public Engagement Manager. So welcome, Claire. Um, Peter, I have one more question for you, actually. So your project went through a bit of an evolution over the past few months. So I know the original plan was for a stop motion animation, but due to the COVID-19 restrictions, uh, you weren't able to get to your studio to film. So actually, we have a sample of the stop motion video that you kindly provided us with that we would love to show. So we, we might show that now, actually. Um, that's okay, we should have the right video ready to go. Perfect. Yeah, it's absolutely wonderful. Um, we can see that you're a really, really skilled animator as well. And I just wanted to ask, um, what would you see as the power of that animations and kind of immersive world such as this one uh, that you've created in this series have in communicating challenging topics? I think it's like I was saying earlier on that it's a language that's understandable. Or like it's on, you know, you can, you're from an early age, you'll be watching cartoons or looking at, you know, picture books and things like that. And especially with animation and with stop motion animation, you can do things that are actually, like they're impossible. Because I, I do make, make sculptures as well. And kinetic sculptures and sometimes with that kind of thing like you really have to engineer them otherwise it just won't work but with animation you can just do one thing like you know you take your shot cut you do something and then you just take your other picture and then you've made something happen that just couldn't have happened otherwise and then i think as well when it's with like the material choices i made and I had this aesthetic of it being kind of handmade. Like I wanted it to look like 
maybe like, like a child had made it or could make it. Like I have this kind of, I've had this sort of running thought for the last couple of years actually about um, with what I'm making, that if something looks like it has been made by a person, then you know that it can be made by a person. And I think there's something either empowering or at least reassuring in that, that, you know, you kind of know that that's possible. And I look like I do, I like looking at things as well that I have no idea how I would even start making those. You know, like, I think that's amazing as well to see something where you just go, that's I, that looks impossible to me. But then I, I really engage with things where I look at them and I start just trying to figure out how it's done. So that's that's really interesting that you would say that as well about um I love that point about you know if, if it looks like um if it looks like it's made by someone it can be made by someone because the educational resource to go along with this project is actually for uh, students to make their own environment for a self-driving car and I remember as well Peter the first time I saw your piece I remember feeling like I was almost in a children's drawing like the aesthetic is so amazing it's, it's absolutely fantastic what you managed to do with this um, I actually have one more question for Martin and Claire as well. So I was wondering um, from, so I might go with, with, I might kind of, there's kind of two aspects to this, but I feel like you'll both be able to answer really, really well. So Martin with uh, Martin and Claire, with future technologies such as driverless cars, that um, they may have a really profound impact on our lives if, if in years to come. And I know, Martin, I think you mentioned before that, you know, um, this was originally directed towards primary learners who will be the drivers and passengers of the future and also the coders of the future. Would you see collaborations with artists such as this one as being part of the process in designing new technology such as this? And for Claire, I suppose, with them, um, would you see collaborations such as this being involved in engaging with the public about these technologies? Uh, yeah, so how to, so, I'm actually really passionate about this, this mix of art, philosophy, science, ethics, applied ethics, if you like. And Peter used the word empowerment, and I think uh, that's an important part of this. Because um, we're, in the main, we're publicly funded scientists, so we, we have a duty to communicate to people uh, at their level. Uh, that includes school children. So if you think about the demographics that are going to be most affected by you know, AI and robots in the future, it's precisely kids at primary school now because they'll probably never drive. They'll be sitting in robot cars in the future. Um, they need to, you know, they need to understand what the risks are. And you, you were on the call with us last week. I thought that, that was really, that was really lively. It was fantastic. So, how often do scientists get access to nine thousand school children in one session? And the chat, I, I know you were following the chat as well, but yeah. it's really lively. Like they, they're really engaged by Peter's work. They're really interested in this type of. Uh, in this type of material, um, robot cars, making a good car, the ethical car, these are really accessible areas for kids to get into, but they're also really important because they're citizens of the future. And this is a public policy matter and people need to kind of plug in as early as possible. Absolutely, that's an excellent point, Martin. Um, and Claire, I wonder if you have any thoughts on this as well. Yeah, I mean, there's a huge emphasis now on, you know, designing things for the end user where you're including a broad spectrum of people. So, you know, we all have these great examples of software that was designed in the past for, you know, the men and the seatbelts and we could go on and on. So, you know, we've come to a stage now where really the importance of input from diverse variety of people is is just hugely important and it's necessary, you know, because we have these systems that, you know, we hear a lot about AI bias and all of that. And, you know, that's current, you know, that's an issue that we have at the moment. So, you know, this idea of bringing in lots of people into these into this process is, is really important. And, you know, it's one thing to talk about software, but if you talk about ethics and software, you know, that's a whole other layer on top of it. You know, it's almost an abstract thing. But I think with Peter's um, work, what's happened is it's kind of slowed us down a little bit and it slowed the kids down because everybody knows about Teslas and, you know, the kids are all up to date and they think they know everything about software. But, you know, I mean, the stop motion animation was, you know, designed initially, but you know, looking at those pictures and we, when we showed it last week, you know, this, the screen at a time, it was slowing us down and slowing the kids down to actually get a concept of 
what the car might be trying to process, you know, because software is so quick now and everything is so computed so fast. So, you know, I think that kind of this project for us has really allowed us to kind of get inside the mind of the vehicle in a way that was accessible to the kids. And the kids were coming up with fantastic questions and they were really interested, you know. So I think for us, um, this is a huge opportunity um, and I think it's great. We'd like to do lots more of this in the future. And I think it's really important that we do it as well. Like Martin said, you know, we have a, 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 an obligation to do it. Absolutely. And it's great to hear that this, um, this, this may not be the end of this project and that you're going to continue engaging with schools on this. That's absolutely fantastic. Um, I'm afraid we've just about run out of time for this q and I feel like we could talk about this all evening. It's such an interesting topic. But I, I just want to say a huge thank you to Peter, Martin and Claire for this amazing conversation and for the wonderful artwork that we saw today. And I'm going to hand back over to Marina now to go on to the next Q&A session. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks a million, Hannah. That was a very interesting conversation. And I think even just thinking about how do machines come across ethical decisions? It's something that's even mind blowing for us to think about uh, when we're driving a car, not to mind to have to make sure that the machine has it programmed into it. Um, so coming out of that, we're going to delve into the marine environment. We're going to move to the underwater world and we're going to move to a project called Kabla, which means otherworldly voices of the sea. So we'll go into that a little bit more in detail, but I'd like to welcome on screen artist Ling Heaney. Um, so she's a visual artist from Bray in County Wicklow, and she has graduated from NCAD in 2015 with a BA in Fine Art and Visual Culture. She uses CGI, digital animation and Blender to create her pieces, so very much into the open source software. We also have Dr. Mark Collin, Owen Daly and Fergus McAuliffe from iCrag. Um, we have another person on the iCrag team. It was a big team this year. So we had Andrew Trafford as well, who unfortunately can't be here tonight. But everything from a marine engineer, marine geologist, marine acoustician, and also, I guess, marine public engagement. So lots going on there. Um, Kaibla was fantastic. I know, Ling, you navigated us through that world so seamlessly in the beginning. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to come to you first because... Let's talk about how dreamy and magical and otherworldly <laughs> that was. Um, so when we're looking at Kaiba, it kind of crosses over between the realms of realism and fantasy. And when we're going through the water, there's kind of little surprises tucked in behind different sections. I know it's 360, so we may not have explored it all in the opening. Um, so you're very attuned to how things move in nature. That's very obvious in the film from the reflections, the movement of the boat. We see the fish coming through in the end. So can you tell us how you decided on the aesthetic for this work um, and how you first came about to love this type of animation? Because we do see that from you in other places. Yeah, so um, I definitely just off the bat would totally recommend you to rewatch it on your phone as well, because you can get like a proper 360 um, uh, effect but yeah um iCrag sent me so many photos and videos and there was so much that I got to just go through that they had and like their um they're like underwater scans that I was able to bring into Blender like there was so much research that I just had on my fingertips so just from that that really helped me to kind of I guess, pick what direction I wanted to go in. Um, but I was really um, inspired at the very start from the colours of the, I have it written down here phonetically because I don't know how to pronounce it, bathymetry. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah. That works. Um, yeah, the rainbow colours from the bathymetry files, I was so interested because that's how kind of the machine sees nature. So I wanted to kind of extract that out and kind of go try and try and meet it <laughs> somewhere in between. <laughs> um, yeah, and that's kind of where I, I started from. The colour was really important. Yeah. Start from. You executed it perfectly. And I guess when we're jumping into that world, it is the sea. We're seeing real things in there, but it's also full of imagination. And I'm just wondering where your love of that kind of colour comes from. 
where did you kind of go towards kind of the pastels in that one? I guess the, the sulfur that I use, it's just perfect for creating that. It's kind of, it kind of comes from the software. Like, I, I don't know how I would recreate it in real life. Um, and because it's 3D animation, you can literally do whatever you want. So if ever I was kind of veering towards something that was a bit too realistic, I'd be like, no, no, no. <laughs> what is that? Make it pink. <laughs> Make it orange. That that is that is wonderful. I actually just think of you at home in this like beautiful dreamy world. <laughs> You've done well. Um, to bring it over to iCrag then, you said you got lots of imagery and you got lots of information on that end. So a lot of your research in iCrag is looking at exploring um, the depths of the sea, looking at the seabed, um, seeing what's around. And I just wanted to check in with you. What is the importance of this kind of research in the Irish context, the marine research site? And also looking how it links in with, with Ling's work. What are we actually seeing in that animation that came from the research itself? Sure. So I suppose to understand the importance of um, of, of our research and, and seabed mapping um, for Ireland, it's really important to understand how important the Irish offshore is. I mean, like really, it's about 10 times the size of our, our landmass or 880,000 square kilometres which may be an abstract number, but it's about 123 million football pitches um, in size. So it's a really a vast area which has a, a wealth of biodiversity and, and resources. So to really kind of understand um, these, these resources, this biodiversity, seabed mapping really kind of underpins uh, a lot of this. So when you consider the various habitats that are out there, so off the west coast of Ireland, we have these magnificent cold water corals. So these are very similar to the kind of corals you see in the tropics, um, but they just happen to be in much deeper uh, water conditions. And we've got these magnificent uh, canyons as well. So you would have seen both of them in the video, actually. Um, and these canyons offer up these really strong biodiversity hotspots where you get like a wealth of, of various different biodiversity. And then these corals and habitats, they obviously respond in different ways to, to climate change. So by studying the seabed, we can actually understand more about environmental change related to, to climate change and how, how climate and environment have evolved over time. So there, the seabed is a sort of a natural record for this. And then I suppose finally, um, in terms of my own research, what I do, um, there's a huge amount of energy potential out there in terms of offshore wind and wave energy. So a lot of my research uses seabed mapping to look at suitable sites to develop um, offshore wind turbines um, effectively. So in terms of the actual physical mapping itself, um, it's very difficult. Uh, you need a boat. And, you know, you saw in, in Lynn's um, video that colour plays a very uh, strong component um, in terms of visualising the seabed, but we actually use sound is, is the kind of main component that we use. So we, we use a sort of form of echolocation almost to, to map the seabed. Um, and, and that's that we, we turn that sound then into colour, which is related to depth. Yeah, it's absolutely fantastic to see even how the physics of that works. Um, you're using one element to create a visual and it, it's just fantastic to see. But in terms of where we are in Ireland in Ling's piece, I mean, there's definitely seabed mapping there that is true to form, right? Oh, absolutely. So, so Lynn has a great, did a great job of kind of visualizing the abstract, but also um, within there, there's actual pieces of, of data of, of, from the seabed. So both um, bits of the seabed off the west coast of Ireland and on the east coast of Ireland, which we've mapped at, at iCraig. Um, but also, I suppose, just for the, the viewers at home, it's important to understand that Ireland has one of the most extensive seabed mapping programs in the world, uh, run by Inframar, uh, which is a joint project between the Geological Survey here in Ireland, as well as the Marine Institute. And all of that magnificent seabed data is available for free for anybody to look at. So I'd encourage you to go and look at that and you get a real sense of the diversity of, of seabed that's out there. Absolutely. I think this piece in itself, as well as the artwork, it really makes you appreciate what we have in Ireland. And I think you probably already know that from your research. <laughs> actually, there's a lot of people that don't have access to seeing the sea or, or seeing underwater. And Ling, you bring that. By, by actually bringing us on a journey. I'm even thinking if you were sitting in a hospital bed, 
you can see what someone out at sea is looking at with an instrument way offshore of Ireland. That's incredible. And that's something that really shows the power of collaboration in this sense. So the film has like a range of senses in it. I think we're, we're almost far touching and smelling what's around us. Everything else is covered. So I wanted to look a little at the soundscapes. Um, there's incredible soundscapes in there, but it is a huge blend of different things going on. And um, speaking to Ling and the sound designer you work with, Ling, Tiva, there is just a phenomenal amount of work. So between everyone, um, Fergus as well, I just wanted to go through what sounds do we hear um, when we're, we're exploring that underwater piece. So I might jump to you first, Ling. Yes, yeah, so the violin was written specifically for this piece. Uh, Tiva is a violinist, so I, I just kind of gave her free reign on that. <laughs> I was like, make it sound a bit Irish. And I think she did a great job. <laughs> and yeah, um, just mixing in, she, she does Foley art as well. So she really knows how to do sound effects as well. Um, and she's able to mix in the um, hydrophone recordings from the guys as well. Absolutely. There is, there's just a fantastic depth to the soundscape. Um, so looking at the acoustics end um, on the, the iCrag side, what are we hearing? Um, uh, yeah, yes. Yeah, so, so I suppose, as, as Lynn said, there is, we have equipment uh, that allows us, they're called passive acoustic monitors. And basically they're little listening robots, I suppose, <laughs> that you, you put out in, uh, underwater and they just record sound continuously. Um, so a lot of the sounds that you're hearing within the piece are, are actually the sounds of, of the sea. Um, so in the marine environment, animals, you, you, there's animals communicating, obviously, so you, you can get a sense of that. But also the, the, the movement of the sea in terms of, of waves and so forth, that generates noise um, naturally. But there's also what we call anthropogenic noise or, or human-made noise in there. Um, which isn't always as advantageous. Um, so we get even from like say our own survey vessels or, or even general uh, um, offshore vessels that are traveling around, they're generating noise, trawlers, they're generating noise. Our, our survey equipment generates a, a certain degree of noise as well. Um, so I suppose what's, what's really important is understanding this and generating a baseline um, of, of this. So this is a very important aspect for um, marine spatial planning going forward, um, is to understand all of this noise, because obviously from a, a marine mammal perspective, inputting human-made noise into the marine environment isn't good for them because they use sound to communicate over long distance, but also to hunt uh, for their food. So if you're interrupting that um, sound, that natural sound, then it could have an impact on, on mammals. And at iCry, Going Daily is, is, is our researcher who's doing a lot of work in that kind of recording soundscapes and, and seeing how that affects um, animals. Yeah, that's, that's great to hear. And actually, when we think of that environment and especially with sound, lots of these animals are communicating in infrasound and ultrasound, which we can't hear. Mm. Actually, one thing I would love to know is how your piece Ling sounds to a marine mammal as opposed to what we hear when we <laughs> look at it. There's definitely other sounds in there, which I'm sure you can see on programming, uh, but we can't hear. So Fergus, just to jump over to you then, there is a big, strong element of culture in this piece as well, and even Irish heritage. Um, so just coming to the name Cobla, uh, where where did that come from? So Kabla is, I guess, where, where the whole idea came from originally. So it's a it's a word that uh, means effectively otherworldly voices heard on the sea um, in the distance at night. So it's it's one of those beautiful Irish words that it's it, it's one word in Irish and it's a whole sentence in English. And it's really it's it comes from um, the, the Mullet Peninsula in Mayo, and where, where, where Mark and I heard about it first was there is a poet and broadcaster called Mancon McGann that people may have heard about, and he started this initiative called the Sea Tamagotchi, and what it was designed to do was to um, effectively um, record old and, and rarely used Irish words, and then to publicise them and to give them to people to mind throughout their life. 
So this particular word, Kabla, he actually gifted to uh, Prince Will and Princess Kate when they came to visit Ireland. He, he gifted this word to them to take forth throughout the rest of their lives and to safeguard. And when we looked into that word, we, we thought it was just, um, it's such a beautiful word, world in and of itself. And we, when we think about Ireland's uh, marine territory, there is so much out there that we know about and there's so much out there that we don't know about at the same time as well. And we really liked that idea of these otherworldly spirit voices out there in the distance. You can kind of hear them. Can you see them? And it was then quite... Uh, quite a nice jump to take that word then and, and be like, okay, well, when do we, or when we think of the sea, what are we thinking about? What is out there? And then we merge into mythology. So you, you may have heard of this, this, uh, this ancient tribe called the, uh, the Fomorians. So the Fomorians are, they're effectively, they're demon spirits and they, they, they live out there in, in, in the sea and uh, kind of in Irish mythology, they would often, uh, come up onto land and they would fight the Tuatha Dé Danann, which are kind of the predecessors uh, 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 to ourselves. And um, according to lore, in, in one, after one particular huge fight, the Fomorians were driven off the land and back into the sea where they now reside. And to, I guess, to bring this full circle, one of, uh, um, one of the researchers in Nygrag has been involved in, in studying um, uh, hydrothermal vents. So these are effectively chimneys at the bottom of the sea out of which come um, high temperature water and minerals and these can be maybe 10 or 20 meters in height and way out off the Irish coast, um, even outside of Ireland's marine territory, just near the Azores, there is one of these hydrothermal vents or chimneys called, um, and it's named after one of these uh, Fomorians called Balor. And he was the he was the king of the Fomorians. He had he only had one eye, but it was a poisonous eye. So whoever he looked at would instantly be killed. So way out in the sea, there is a, there is um, an element of Irish mythology that is uh, preserved out there. And and then how Ling then kind of brought that into the video, where we see these unusual kind of hands and arms, and they're kind of grasping towards you, and it's a little bit unnerving. We found that to be a highly effective representation of when science meets mythology. Absolutely. That was a great encapsulated lesson in Irish folklore. I loved it. Um, so from, I guess, all of that, we're coming in on time now. Um, there has just been, there's shivers running up people's spines when they hear this. If you're completely immersed, I would totally say, get a pair of headphones, put it on and have it on your phone. It's incredible, even if just for meditation for a few minutes. Um, but just to finish up um, for today, so thanks a million to all of you for your incredible work and the incredible work on the resources as well. There's a lot of work going on in there. Quick fire between all of you. What do you see for the future of marine research and art working together? So I might come to you first, Mark. Oh, it, this this has been a just a marvelous experience uh, to be quite honest. And, and I think a lot of the, the researchers have said it just, looking at our data in a new way and looking at, at our research in a different way and then how we use that to interact with the public, there's there's huge uh, possibility there. Because I think as a as an island nation, we may not have always engaged with our with our with our sea um, in in ways that we we could have done. But there's always this what always brings the sea to people is art. It's it's music, it's it's imagery. So definitely bringing the science of the sea to people, art is the key, I would say. Perfect. And then quickly to you, Ling, quickly to Fergus, and we'll wrap up there. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's just so much resources that iCrag have, and like I could have taken it in so many different directions. <laughs> like there's at least 10 other projects in there. Um, so yeah, I just think more, more of this, more of the same. <laughs> more of the same. That yeah. works, uh, I'll take more of that. I'll be there watching <laughs> when the next thing happens. Um, and finally, Fergus, just for the last punchy word on, on where we see the future of this. Yeah, so we've done lots of collaboration with the arts in, in iCrag over the years, be it poetry, we've done it through baking, through sculpture, through uh, a choral performance. I have a dream to someday uh, hold a science rave in a cave. Great. So I, I'll leave it at that. A rave in a cave is where I see this ending up. <laughs> rave in a cave. We'll end on that note. Ling, I hope you're ready for the rave in a cave. 
Thanks a million. You've been a fantastic team. And I'm going to hand back over to Hannah now to come in on our final artwork for today. Thanks so much, Marina. So last but not least, uh, we come to a project which in, it integrates cutting edge technology with mediums of sound, light and movement. So we have artist Ed Devan, who you may recognize from the plastics exhibition at the Science Gallery. And we also have Jerry Horgan and Dr. Dr. Deirdre Coban as well. What an amazing way to end the evening with a project that explored how to interpret the very intricate theories behind quantum mechanics through space in such an interactive and dynamic way. So Ed, I might come to you first. Um, interpreting these concepts was such an ambitious task that was executed so brilliantly in your work, Rotation Relay. Uh, could you explain this artwork to the audience and describe how you decided on materials and movements of the piece and the relationships between these used to represent certain aspects of how quantum communications works? Sure. Um, I suppose it's important for me to say at the start that my understanding of quantum uh, communications is a little bit better than what it was before. Um, Jerry and Deirdre definitely simplified it for me in a way that I could kind of comprehend. Um, I suppose it's, for me, it's kind of hard to grasp the complexity of it. And uh, in trying to understand their research, I compared it to my own experience in, in using technology in making art um, and tried to, tried to find a way that I could kind of interpret it and uh, process it through, through my practice. So um, I looked at a couple of things specifically. Uh, I suppose the, the actual laser communication side of, of what they do, um, I could immediately think of the uh, a way of interpreting that. Um, there's a kind of a fairly common project where you can use a laser pointer to uh, send data, like an audio signal or digital signal or whatever, um, which I had done years ago when I was learning electronics, um, kind of just experimenting with things. Um, so, so basically part of that, uh, you could see in the video and you can see the, the piece here behind me. Um, there's basically a, an audio signal that is generated and is communicated through the light coming from this laser up here, um, which gets sent to this smaller unit here and it matches the, uh, the audio being generated by the main piece. So what I was kind of going for with that uh, pairing uh, or mirroring, I suppose, of... Um, the signal being in two locations was the uh, the entanglement. Am I right, Jerry? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but Jerry's coming to us from space as well. <laughs> uh, teleportation, actually, teleportation was probably more um, more what I was getting at. That kind of idea that um, the the information from one um, one atom can be kind of communicated to another another location and that information can be sent in that way. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what I was going with, with that. And then how the thing is actually built is really, um, it's kind of, it's based on the idea of the gyroscope. Um, they basically kind of taking the movement of uh, the photon around an atom and um, trying to think of a kind of a, a visual real world analog for something that's, so tiny and kind of imperceptible um, and the gyroscope in that it's a device that can rotate in multiple dimensions um, yeah I just tried to think how could I how could I build something like that that uh, used movement light and sound together in a way that was kind of engaging that would appeal to the target audience which is kind of school primary school age children um, so yeah. It's brilliant. Thank you so much, Ed. And it's great. It's, it's, it's such an achievement to take such, I suppose, quite abstract concepts uh, that many of us wouldn't be familiar with and interpret them in such a tangible way. And hopefully we will eventually be able to see this, this piece in a space and we can actually, um, you can actually work, um, kind of change the controls yourself to change the movement of the piece, right? As well. Yeah. 
Mm. So that's going to be amazing if we can get into a physical space. And I would definitely recommend having a look at it in the virtual exhibition as well. So um, on that point, actually, so quantum communications is something that many of us in the room may not be familiar with. But I suppose, Jerry and Deirdre, in as succinct a way as possible, what is quantum communications? And what are the advan advantages of communication communicating through space specifically? And is this very different than our current communications infrastructure? Uh, okay, there's a lot in there, and I'll, uh, I'll try and unpack it as, uh, as easily as I can. So quantum communications, it's primarily um, driven by security. So quantum computers are common, and they're able to crack encryption that we would use for our internet banking and stuff very, very quickly. They will soon enough. And what we have to do is create a new communications mechanism that is very secure. So as Ed started this guy, he started talking about teleportation and uh, entanglement and things like these. And these are all basic quantum properties. And without getting into too much of the details of that, uh, what entanglement means is you can get two photons and tiny bits of light, but they get bound together. They get completely bound together, but you can separate them and send them uh, to, to distances quite far apart. And whatever you do to one happens to also happen to the other one as well. And so you can make a change to one or you can interact with one and that will happen. And then that can be translated to the far end very quickly. Uh, so that's what's known as teleportation. And that teleportation is very secure and that can be over any kind of distance. Uh, the other properties then that we have is we have things like superposition, which is what you'd see with that gyroscope as it's spinning around. We're able to, to get a bit more data from that. Uh, so uh, that's maybe a little bit um, hard. The reason for doing it via space is the fiber optics. So it's all light based what we're doing. Fiber optics are light based as well, but um, fiber optic is still actually slow, believe it or not. And it's actually much quicker for us to go up into space, uh, travel across through space and come back down. So actually about twice as fast. So that's the reason why we want to do it through space. So it's faster and more secure is ultimately is the very short answer. Okay, so that's the advantages there. Um, and Deirdre, did you have anything to add there in terms of how quantum communication works and yeah. uh, the, the concepts, in, I suppose, interpreted in Ed's piece? Sure, I was just going to say it'll be kind of a hybrid um, system. It, we'll also continue to use the fibre based in and around cities. Um, there'll be a classical uh, network as well. And then they'll also use communication um, via the satellites. And I mean, this is driven in Europe and in China and also across the US. It's all around the world. Everybody's pushing for a quantum internet, um, which will bring all these security advantages that Jerry talked about. And they expect that this will happen by about 2030. So it's not too far away. That's absolutely brilliant. So um, what I might, I might go back to Ed then, just I suppose, Superposition, teleportation, and entanglement are only kind of some of the concepts that are represented in this work. So, Ed, I know you use sound and engineering quite a lot in your work. And then, Jerry and Deirdre, you're also both from very technical backgrounds. So, I feel this team gelled so well together because of kind of all of you do come from technical backgrounds. So, I was wondering, as a team, how did this collaboration play into each of your strengths? So, I might start with Ed. Um... Well, I suppose the the idea that I kind of proposed um, was building on experience that I've gained over years with uh, electronics and digital fabrication, so using 3D printing and laser cutting and things like that, um, uh, circuit board manufacture, like all these things that I've kind of been I've been using in my practice over years and adding to my repertoire of uh, abilities, I suppose this piece kind of encapsulates uh, a lot of those skills that I've built up, um, which kind of makes it pretty tricky to build really like this. There, it wasn't an easy piece to make. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy that it actually works, which is uh, always satisfying. But, um, but yeah, I suppose in that, uh, you know, it's, it's got a, a sonic component that had to be programmed with C code using an, uh, an Arduino. Um, you know, like I, I just wasn't able to do that maybe five years ago. Uh, so that's 
yeah, I, I suppose whenever I whenever I get a commission, I try to push myself to learn new skills uh, and to kind of improve the ones that I have. So that's definitely the case with this. That's amazing. It's great to hear that. Um, it's amazing to hear that kind of these are skills you've kind of built up recently and that you were able to use them in this piece. Um, Deirdre, I might come to you next, I suppose, in terms of how the collaboration played into um, your strengths as a researcher. Um, I think it's quite interesting about um, Ed mentioning he learned some new skills there about Arduino and C programming because that's the type of thing we see quite a bit in science fairs. I'm quite involved in science fairs and, you know, I think this piece will really work very well in the schools because you can bring it to the level of what the students will understand as well um, by describing the new skills that you picked up. Um, I suppose, from my point of view, it was always about trying to make these concepts understandable for the public and for students. So from that point of view, I really enjoyed doing this project. That's absolutely brilliant. So Jerry, I might come to you next in terms of um, uh, the strengths of this collaboration, if you've any thoughts there. Yes, so it was, um, we did our best to explain the concepts, even as we understand them. So sometimes we don't fully understand them ourselves. So we did our best to explain them to Ed without confusing Ed or confusing ourselves. And it was a real iterative process. So we started with photons, then we started talking about superposition, so just the spinning and um, uh, things like that. And then we started talking about degrees of freedom and lots more technical things. And we would bring in one at a time and let Ed go off and think about it. And he'd digest it, internalize it, and he'd come back with something. And so we never tried to influence what Ed was doing. It was up, we always thought that it was for Ed to interpret it. So we'll explain it as best as we can and it has to interpret it, you know, and I think that's why this has worked out. Absolutely, you know, that absolutely, it definitely comes across. It's absolutely amazing um, how you've managed to kind of, I suppose, encapsulate such such abstract concepts. Um, I'd love actually to go back to, I know Jerry and Deirdre, you both mentioned about how the um, quantum computers and how the, about how the internet will look very different in the future. And I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit on that. I know Deirdre, you mentioned potentially 2030 is when we could start seeing some of these changes. I was wondering um, what would these changes look like for us in the next 30 to 50 years? Um, I guess we can't really anticipate. There's some problems out there that we need to think about trying to solve that we can't solve with our current computers. But when we get the um, quantum computing going, and if you can have quantum computers connected over a distributed network of uh, quant like true quantum communication, then you get a much powerful, more powerful machine and you can solve more difficult problems. So to to the average person, it's not going to look that different. You'll still just type away on your on your laptop and do and solve problems or send your emails. Emails just might arrive somewhere else more quickly, or you can send much more in your email, um, or you can do much more. You can send much more information across this, and it will be um, future-proof, secure. Okay, very interesting. And Jerry, do you have any thoughts there? Anything you'd like to add? Yeah, it's really around the security, you know, um, the security is the major driver of it, but there's also a capability to get much more information into, into, into less space effectively. So we could see a real explosion in, uh, in data rates. Uh, so uh, your download capacity, that kind of stuff, that could get very, very fast. Okay, very interesting. And I suppose there's one final question for all three of you. Um, how important is it for younger generations to harness the power of creativity and innovation in creating new possibilities such as this technology? So I don't know if, if anybody want to jump in and go first or maybe we'll go to Ed first. Um, I suppose creativity is sort of the, the binder that can pull together lots of different, uh, different bases of knowledge um you know you could to be able to combine different things uh in your in your mind is the ability to create to to take influences from different areas and uh yeah split them in split them into something new um it's a it's an amazingly uh, important skill to learn and i think children are kind of innately creative it maybe gets uh, learnt out of them in school more so than encouraged. So, um, 
Yeah, I, yeah. It's it's a hard thing to uh, quantify um, to teach in itself. Um, when I give workshops, I, I generally try to uh, impart that kind of creative uh, experience through giving children and young people um, an insight into what I do because I, I get a huge kick out of being creative. It just it fulfills my soul to to do what I do. Um, so yeah, I, I just try to uh, share that as much as I can. So. That's absolutely a wonderful message. Thank you so much, Ed. And uh, Deirdre, we might go to you next then. Sure. Um, well, I can just see that the piece that Ed's created, uh, I would never have come up with myself. Um, I think it's brilliant. And it just shows that if you just put physicists or um, scientists together, maybe we're not accessing that aspect of our brain as much, the creative side. And um, I think collaborations like this are hugely important, especially because it gives um, an opportunity to explain your research in an accessible way to everybody. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. And uh, Jerry, you might go to you last then. What, um, what do you think about harnessing the power of creativity and innovation? Yeah, so just to echo Deirdre's last point there, you know, it's, it's, it's a great way to explain something that's really abstract, or something you can't see. Uh, but the other side of it, though, is like I grew up in Star Trek and Star Wars and all these things that are just so well that they're not possible. But they kind of are, you know, and it's that creativity that these children will have. They're going to come along and they're going to make these things that they just thought were out of this world and were completely impossible. I love that. Yeah, I'm being inspired by Star Trek and now you're working with quantum communications in space. <laughs> That's brilliant. That's absolutely fantastic. We're unfortunately out of time, but um, I just want to thank you all so much for being here and thank you for a really interesting discussion. And uh, the piece is absolutely phenomenal. I would recommend everybody to go into the virtual exhibition and to check it out again. Thank you all so much for being here today. And I'm just going to hand back over to Marina for just a really short closing. And uh, thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks a million, Hannah. That was an absolutely brilliant talk. I've actually noted it down myself. Getting a kick out of being creative fulfills my soul. I think that kind of encapsulates absolutely everyone involved in this project. The passion that has been shown throughout has just been phenomenal. So thank you to all of the teams. Thank you to Ling Heaney, David Beatty, Peter Nash, Ed Devan, Siobhan Doherty, and, and sorry, I went through all of them. There we go. Um, so it's the end of the night. The sun is setting on me. My, my screen is turning orange for some reason. Um, but I would like to say, I hope you had a great time. Just to recap, we started with APC Microbiome in Cork and we talked with Siobhan Doherty. We looked at lino printing and how that replication looks at PCR. Then we jumped into a chat with Future Neuro and David Beatty, looking at how neural networks work in our brain everything from inside here in the electrical activity to bioluminescence to rhizomes to computer neural net networks. There's lots going on there to think about. We jumped in with Lero and Peter Nash. We explored the world of AI and ethics and how cars will eventually make decisions. Uh, is that possible? Um, then we jumped into the dreamy world of the underwater ocean, especially offshore in Ireland, which is absolutely incredible. It's right on our doorstep. Ling Heaney brought us through a navigation of the sea. We looked at bioacoustics, we looked at seabed mapping and marine engineering and lots of great stuff that comes with that when you bring it together for creativity. Then we went over to Connect and Ed Devan, ending on that wonderful phrase about creativity. But just to reiterate, there is a phenomenal amount of work that has been put in behind this. There's resources that were created along with the artworks. There was the design process, the collaborations and the learning, and then the eventual end product. So nine months later, this is where we are. And we really hope that you, the audience, get to enjoy and experience what these project teams have managed to create. So finally, to do a big thank you to all of the teams involved, to you as the audience, to Hannah absolutely for hosting um, today, for Connor and Michael who are behind the scenes. They're doing a lot, making sure our transitions and everything work there. To Margie, who's the head of education. Back to Ruth, who opened for us at the beginning of today. So she's the director of public engagement within SFI. Then the teams themselves. So again, 
let's name them again, they deserve it, it's a celebration. Siobhan Doherty, David Beatty, Peter Nash, Ling Heaney, Ed Devan, the teams at APC Microbiome, Future Neuro, Lero, iCrag and Connect. Well done, you have done a phenomenal job. And now it's time to hand it over to the public. It's there in the 3D exhibition. We have resources on the way. We have a program to self-guide you. And over the next three months, please feel free to explore and create. Send us your images if you want to as well. And primary science at sfi.ie if you have any questions on the STEAM art collaboration. We're delighted to say this is the end of the opening evening. Go ahead, enjoy, celebrate for the teams. We'll see you again soon. And hopefully this is not the end for STEAM. We want to see more of this. So on that note, thanks a million everyone. Thanks for joining and we'll see you again.